What once seemed like a far-flung fantasy is now unfortunately feeling more and more like a real-life possibility. But what would really happen if Russia tried to invade the US through Alaska, six months before the invasion? The war in the Pacific is at a stalemate. China successfully invaded Taiwan, stationing nearly 200,000 troops on the island. The American response was significantly delayed due to political infighting, but eventually US forces mobilized across the Pacific. However, the slow US response allowed China to cross the Taiwan Strait with the bulk of its forces, with the US ceding the initiative to the invaders. Unable to establish air and naval superiority over the skies and waters around the island, the US and its allies face an uphill and very costly battle. 3,000 American combat aircraft are destroyed in the fighting, most while still sitting on the runway as Chinese ballistic missiles rain down from the skies, along with three dozen major surface vessels. The Chinese suffer worse losses, but with the fight being closer to home, they're able to concentrate their effort and reconstitute combat power faster, leading to a stalemate. Things are looking bad for the US, but they're about to get much worse, four months before the invasion. Russia's begun moving troops to its far eastern border with China under the guise of strengthening border security as US spy satellites track the transfer of several large landing vessels to the Russian Pacific Fleet's headquarters in Vladivostok. Intelligence analysts speculated that Russia might target disputed Japanese islands, and with the war against China consuming so many resources, a small US-led alliance has to seriously consider allowing a temporary occupation over declaring all-out war on Russia. At the same time in the Middle East, Iran launches a surprise attack on Israel. Ballistic missiles and drone swarms descend upon the nation, and Israeli, US, Jordanian, UK, and French assets in the region scramble to intercept the attack. Dozens of drones find their targets, only a quarter of the ballistic missiles strike true, hardest hit are Israeli desalination plants, immediately throwing the country into a water crisis, as the small nation relies heavily on pulling drinkable water out of the ocean. It feels like the world is plunging into another worldwide conflict, and this is only the beginning. Three months before the invasion, Europe's unable to respond to either crisis in the Pacific or the Middle East. Now in the midst of its own fighting with China, the US cuts off all aid to Ukraine, leaving Europe alone in its effort to counter Russian aggression. This has allowed Russia to make significant gains in Ukraine, pushing all the way to the Dnipro River itself. The Israeli water crisis continues to worsen, despite desperate attempts to import water. Houthi rebels, backed by Iran, have made shipping aid through the Red Sea impossible thanks to an influx of anti-ship missiles, and the US Navy is overwhelmed attempting to maintain order, having transferred the majority of its combat power to the Asian theater. Aid that had been promised by European allies in the US's war against China has not materialized after the abandonment they felt from the US pulling out of Ukraine, and in turn European militaries are unable to neutralize the Houthi threat without US support. To make matters worse, Iran has mobilized its network of asymmetrical forces to launch attacks against both Israel's borders and at ships flagged to travel to Israel. European navies are unaccustomed to operating together, and they lack the logistical and intelligence resources that the US has historically provided. A state of open war between Israel and Iran is declared, but with two nations between them, the war is mostly waged via air and missile strikes. A resurgence of asymmetrical threats in the region and calls for peacekeeping forces by allies forces the US to deploy a large expeditionary force. American combat power is beginning to be stretched from attempting to put out multiple global fires, all while waging a high-intensity war in the Pacific. The situation is reaching its breaking point, one week before the invasion. Russia begins loading troops onto landing ships and civilian cargo vessels converted for military use. While unable to bring its entire amphibious capability to one area, Russia still manages to ferry nearly 300 tanks, several hundred armored vehicles, and several thousand soldiers in one major amphibious task force. The fleet would normally be tracked via satellite and shadowed by US long-range drones and submarines, but the war with China has resulted in both nations largely destroying or neutralizing their space networks. The US also has lagged behind in submarine production for two decades and is now paying the price for it. Nonetheless, a single boat manages to track the fleet as it departs Vladivostok and heads out into the Pacific. Over the next few days, the fleet makes a surprise turn north, not south toward the contested Japanese islands that it was predicted to move on. Braving the winter in the Bering Sea weather, the fleet is met by a second small fleet of massive icebreakers near St. Lawrence Island, 
Despite tensions between the US and its European allies, alarm bells sound throughout NATO command structures. They believe the most likely target for the fleet is a surprise attack on one of the Scandinavian countries. But the move was a ruse. Russian submarines opened fire, and the lone US sub is forced to break away or be overwhelmed by the sudden appearance of a large number of Russian subs and anti-submarine aircraft. Free of their tail, the fleet turned south, heading for the gap between Unimak and the Akutan Islands, along the Aleutian Islands chain. As they approach, they pass the smoldering remains of US long-range radars destroyed at the start of the war by Chinese missile strikes. Part of their strategy to blind the US to a northern attack by strategic bombers on the Pacific Fleet's headquarters in Hawaii. Flying out of Eielson and Elmendorf Air Force bases, US recon aircraft attempt to track the Russian fleet. But US air forces have been significantly attrited in war against China. The fleet is located as it slips past the Aleutians, a Coast Guard cutter having discovered them earlier but having been sunk after transmitting their location. It's clear now the fleet is heading for Anchorage, Alaska one of the few deep water ports available for such a large force across all of Alaska. The Russian-American War has begun. Day 1 of the Invasion What would have once been impossible has now been made possible by a combination of isolationism, distancing allies, and the demands of a high-intensity war and multiple global flash fires. Under any other circumstance, the fleet of F-15s, F-22s, F-16s, and F-35s would have rained death on anyone stupid enough to attempt an approach to Alaskan shores. All of the F-22s and F-35s have either been lost in combat or transferred to airfields closer to the fighting around Taiwan. Much the same for Eielson and Elmendorf's F-15Cs and F-15Es. Alaska is not defenseless, though, and first blood is drawn by the remaining fleet of F-15s, firing older Harpoon anti-ship missiles. Russian escort craft help fend off the air attack as well as the presence of multiple jerry-rigged air defense systems like Buk and even S-300 that have been in effect bolted on to large civilian ferries. After years of war in Ukraine, the Russians have become masters of improvisation. Some of the harpoons strike true, though. Unfortunately, the missile has a small warhead that was already in question during the Cold War. Modern and massive civilian roll-on roll-off or ro-ro ships suffer only moderate damage from the 488-pound warhead. More modern long-range anti-ship missiles with a beefier 1,000-pound warhead have been in high demand in the Pacific, and none are available for the defense of Alaska. The Coast Guard itself completely is incapable of challenging the Russian fleet, and it's ordered to remain out of the fight. A rain of ballistic missiles, however, puts an end to the flight operations out of Elmendorf and Eielson Air Force Base. Despite having robust ballistic missile defenses, many of them are older generation and overwhelmed by a large salvo of Russian missiles. They were meant to defend against a small-scale attack by rogue actors like North Korea, not a major saturation attack. Landing operations, however, do not go smoothly. Special forces dispatched from Fort Wainwright near Fairbanks arrived in Anchorage a day ago, making a lengthy journey via Blackhawks. Piers are booby-trapped, ships sunk in place to block Russian ships from mooring, it takes the Russians two full days to fully unload their combat forces. They are small in scale, but so are the US forces in Alaska, with only about two brigades in the state during peacetime. Most of the one has been deployed to the Middle East due to the outbreak of fighting, while the rest is in recovery from its last deployment. A striker brigade from Fort Wainwright, the Arctic Wolves, is quickly deployed down Highway 3. It's a light combat force, as there is not a single Abrams tank in all of Alaska but its high mobility and unique Arctic training make it extremely well suited for defending against the Russian incursion. In the lower 48, US war planners mold a situation. The demands in the Middle East and the Pacific are high, and the relative value of Alaska is low. Alaska is in fact the only state that the president has not mandated by law to defend, thanks to the 1959 Statehood Act. American strategy has been the same since Eisenhower's time. Alaska would likely be one front of a much larger war, and difficult to maintain enough forces in to successfully defend. Reinforcements from the lower 48 would take time to organize and ship north, and likely be needed in much more strategically important fronts of a larger war. A decision is made, the defense of Alaska would be conducted by light infantry forces best suited to move in difficult terrain and easier to fly north than heavy combat brigades equipped with Abrams and Bradleys. The Alaskan Territorial Guard is reactivated. In World War II, the Territorial Guard mobilized thousands of indigenous people to fight against the brief Japanese occupation. Alaskans are well suited to the task.
The climate is harsh, as is the land, and many Alaskans either hunt or are proficient with firearms due to a need to protect oneself from the large wildlife. Thousands of volunteers armed with long rifles, ATVs, and snowmobiles answer the call to arms, organizing quickly in the face of the Russian invasion of Anchorage. Day 3 of the Invasion The occupation of Anchorage went smoother than the Russian host expected. The only major military force near the city was stationed at Joint Base Elmendorf-Richardson, which had gotten hammered with ballistic missile strikes days ago. But the Russians were surprised to meet no resistance as an armored column including T-90 tanks moved up Highway 1 toward the installation. By the time the Russian forces had secured it, they discovered it vacated. Any sensitive equipment including all the computers destroyed to deny the enemy any intelligence value. The Russians wouldn't have to wait long to discover where the Americans had disappeared to. Day 5 of the Invasion Arriving via two chartered civilian aircraft, six military officers from the Finnish Armed Forces touched down at Eielsen Air Force Base. NATO's Article 5 did not commit the alliance to declare war in case one was attacked, rather it simply required that each nation respond to the threat in a manner they saw appropriate. After the new American administration had abandoned Europe to Russia in Ukraine, the Europeans had repaid the favor. Most NATO countries responded with symbolic sanctions. There were few meaningful economic punishments left to leverage after five years of fighting in Ukraine. Finland had not declared war on Russia given its precarious position along Russia's border and the reluctance of the rest of the alliance to confront Russia militarily. But it had dispatched a team of observers to Alaska with the US's permission. Alaska was home to the U.S. Army's only Arctic Combat Brigade, and they were experts at fighting in the harsh climate of their native terrain. But they now faced exactly the type of war that Finland had long prepared for before joining NATO. Up against a force of just over two times their number and equipped with superior heavy combat vehicles, fresh reinforcements were arriving daily both by sea and air. Attack helicopters were being offloaded from cargo ships, giving Russian forces air superiority. Not all shipments made the treacherous journey, with the U.S. Navy peeling off a portion of its sub-forces from the war around Taiwan to interdict Russian shipping, but enough was making it to Anchorage that it left U.S. Army forces in Alaska woefully outmatched. This was exactly the type of war the Finns had been preparing for for decades, and their expertise in both Arctic combat and deep knowledge of Russian tactics and equipment would prove invaluable. Day 10 of the Invasion Canadian fighter jets had effectively shut down Russian air transport into southern Alaska, the nation finally declaring war on Russia after deeming the presence of Russian forces on its doorstep too great a risk to tolerate. Russia had responded with ballistic missile strikes over the North Pole, putting the entire world on the brink. The Kremlin had repeatedly announced it would not utilize nuclear weapons, but every salvo was a risk that they were lying. Russia's ballistic missile stockpile was low, though and ultimately hammering Canadian airfields with long-range weapons was too big a provocation for even the Kremlin to accept. The fact that engineers simply filled in the craters and had the airfield operational again within 24 hours only made the exercise even more futile. Regardless, the Canadian Air Force wasn't in the greatest shape. Even pre-war, it was struggling to meet NORAD requirements for defense of North America. It also lacked many of the special mission airframes needed to untangle the growing Russian air defense network popping up across Anchorage. The U.S. was short on everything for its own air force, given the six months of high-intensity war in the Pacific, compounding the difficulties for Canada. At the very least, they could keep Russian transports from making the journey across the Bering Sea. Day 12 of the Invasion Troops picked for the Alaska assault were all hardened combat veterans from the war in Ukraine. Many had Arctic combat training, but not all. Once Russia had fielded large forces proficient in unique requirements of cold-weather fighting, but that was before the meat grinder of Ukraine. Still, the demands of the troops were relatively low given that the Russian force had barely moved out of Anchorage, slowly building its numbers. Some elements had pushed up Highway 1 to secure the bridges crossing the numerous wide but shallow rivers outside of Anchorage, though the ice was thick enough they could have crossed over it if need be, probably why the Americans hadn't bothered to mine them. But life in Anchorage wasn't easy. Much of the local population had simply kept its head down but Alaska is home to a significant number of experienced hunters, trappers, and outdoorsmen. Many of these had taken to the woods or answered the call to reform the Alaskan Territorial Guard. Some had started forming small resistance cells in the city itself, and frustrating Russian efforts for nearly two weeks now was the presence of an unknown number of American Special Operations Forces. They wore no uniforms and seemed to melt into the city outskirts, 
striking both at random and high-value targets. One S-300 system was destroyed by a drone raid, a flight of large and small switchblade drones descending onto the air defense unit. Electronic warfare jammers had been set up to protect key sites, but the army had learned from the conflict in Ukraine, and new generation switchblades came with artificial intelligence that allowed them to pick their own targets if the frequency hopping link back to their controller was jammed or interrupted. It wasn't enough to win the war, but if something wasn't done, it would lead to death by a thousand small cuts. Week 3 of the Invasion A force of just over a thousand combat vehicles had been assembled in Anchorage, hinting at the true aim of the Russian attack. This wasn't about taking one city or territory, but rather the entire state. Russian nationalists were already trumpeting the triumphant return of the Alaskan territory to the Russian Federation. The massive force absolutely dwarfed the single striker combat brigade standing between the Russians and the only major American military presence in the state at Eielson and Fort Wainwright. There was one significant problem for the invaders though, and that was Alaska's highway system. Simply put, there wasn't much of one. A single highway ran north to Fairbanks and another east to the Canadian border. No other suitable roads existed for Russian troops to move through, and what bush trails did exist were far too small and rough for combat vehicles. And anyways, they would have required the cooperation of Alaskan natives to navigate, which the Russians were having little success even finding in the rugged wilderness outside of Anchorage. Somewhere inside Denali National Park, the 1st Striker Brigade Combat Team 25th Infantry had set up multi-layered blocking positions. The terrain was a nightmare for an attacker, with thickly wooded forests and steep inclines along Highway 3. It was perfect for a vastly outmanned defender though. Week 4 of the Invasion the attacks had been constant since crossing the major bridges outside of Anchorage, where the terrain became thickly wooded. The Russians didn't know if they were dealing with American military forces or local partisans, but they guessed it was a mixture of both. Those using anti-tank missiles must have been regular military forces, though. The Russian convoy was limited to the small highway leading north out of Anchorage, sometimes three lanes wide, sometimes four. The further north they moved, though, the narrower the highway became, limiting their mobility. The attacks would come from either side of the convoy, usually striking in the middle and the rear of different formations, sowing chaos. The Russians would return fire blindly into the woods, but before the infantry could seriously engage their ambushers, the Americans would melt away into the forest, typically speeding off in snowmobiles. Drones were sometimes successful in chasing them down, but even then the snowmobiles moved so fast and the woods were so thick, they could rarely manage to take out more than one snowmobile before they were simply out of range. Many drones were lost in the thick branches that sheltered the Americans in their getaway. The invaders had brought some snowmobiles with them, but planned on simply confiscating most of the winter mobility equipment they needed from locals. There were, after all, more snowmobiles in Alaska than cars. What they hadn't planned on was a mass campaign of sabotage carried out by the natives, spurred on by orders broadcast over television networks and internet channels. Thousands of snowmobiles in the Anchorage area and surrounding communities had either disappeared or been destroyed before the Russians could get their hands on them. Russian authorities carried out brutal reprisals on a few discovered saboteurs, publicly executing them as a show of force. That had resulted in the well-armed population enacting a reprisal of its own, with partisan attacks skyrocketing in the wake of the executions. Week 5 of the Invasion If there was a single blessing in this frozen hell of a campaign, thought many Russians, it was that American air power was almost completely out of the picture. Russia had difficulty bringing its own air power to bear, with Canadian fighters armed with very long-range AIM-260s keeping the small Russian air fleet largely out of the fight. They hadn't even bothered to use their attack helicopters in a meaningful way yet, fully expecting American forces lurking in the wilderness to pick them off with man pads the moment they flew overhead. They would be expended sacrificially to destroy American defensive positions along Highway 3, as they were discovered. The increasingly difficult terrain and narrow road making it incredibly unlikely ground assaults could get the job done. But the Russians hadn't even reached the outskirts of Denali yet. The convoy north echoing the disaster of the infamous convoy south into Kyiv from Belarus in 2022. Except this time, the Russians had gotten their logistics right. This time the convoy was stalled over and over again due to the overwhelming number of attacks. The further north the Russians traveled, the thicker the woods and the more difficult the terrain. Combat vehicles had no hope in hell of traversing the three feet of snow on either side of the road this far north, and straying far from the asphalt almost guaranteed getting stuck. The road here had only two lanes, and the only way for the convoy to move forward was with the use of snowplows. 
The sprawling 30-mile convoy split up into smaller groups like a long, segmented earthworm. The Americans would ignore the tanks and armored vehicles, instead lobbing anti-tank missiles, mortars, and recoilless rifles at supply and fuel trucks, especially at the recovery and engineering vehicles. With engineering vehicles knocked out of order, others would have to be brought up from deep in the rear to clear the road of wreckage and allow the convoy to continue moving. That would add a day or more as the vehicles were carefully moved aside with some inevitably getting stuck on the snowy shoulder. Further along in the rear, Alaskan partisans would harass the convoy with small arms fire. Russian officers and drivers were a high priority, and even with the use of drones, the lifelong frontiersmen would be long gone before any significant response could be mounted. Transplants from the lower 48th, local-born Alaskans, and natives with family lines in the area stretching back thousands of years, all of them knew how to move, live, and survive in the harsh Alaskan wilderness. They were ghosts if they wanted to be, the thick snows stopping any attempt to chase them down. Casualties were mounting. 15% of the invasion force had been killed or seriously injured. 20% of what remained had been wounded at least once or fallen prey to cold injuries. Stalled out troops waiting to move forward were easy victims for the creeping cold, approaching negative 40 degrees in the dead of night, sometimes colder with the wind chill. Winter had been chosen, knowing it would make it meaningless for the defenders to blow the many bridges that crossed over the hundreds of Alaskan rivers, and because it would paralyze any attempt to send significant reinforcements from the lower 48. But the Russians had gone into this fight knowing that they were in a race against time. Once troops left the relative safety of Anchorage, they had to move quickly to objectives or risk becoming winter casualties. Two weeks in, and they barely moved 100 miles. Week 6 of the Invasion Alaska was just too remote to elicit a major reaction from American voters, and Russian forces were basically contained to Anchorage and surrounding areas, making the invasion a less pressing threat in the minds of the population. Thus, there was no major pressure to cut short the war in the South Pacific and redirect resources north. Alaska would be liberated eventually if the Russians didn't freeze to death first. Fighting in Denali State Park had been brutal. The Americans had spent weeks preparing against the slow-moving Russian convoy. The highway itself had been mined and booby-trapped. Explosives set under the highway or on the ridge lines caused the highway to crumple down steep ravines or rock showers to smash into passing vehicles from above. Many Russians plummeted to their deaths or were crushed to death inside their vehicles. If there was one benefit to the narrow highway, it's that the tanks leading the advance could present their thickly protected front to the enemy. But that did little good when they were not facing tanks, but instead highly mobile striker anti-tank vehicles armed with guided missiles, or dismounted anti-tank teams deploying along ridge lines or in the forests. The Russians had learned lessons from Ukraine, but they weren't facing the Ukrainian army. They were facing a modern combined arms force. Strikers fired off missiles from vantage points along dirt roads paralleling the highway or behind barricades of thick tree trunks, reversing quickly and moving out of sight down the winding highway before Russian tanks could respond. At the same time, deployed drone teams rained switchblade drones down along the Russian infantry that attempted to dismount and defend the convoy, while other drones acted as forward observers for mortar teams. Anti-tank teams ringed the ridgelines and fired off volleys of missiles before disappearing back into the wilderness. The Americans refused to be decisively engaged, retreating shortly after making contact. They were trading territory for blood, knowing that any attempt to mount a standing defense would only favor Russia's superior numbers, no matter how narrowly channeled they were. Winter was on their side as well. They didn't have to defeat all of Russia's tanks, they only had to starve them of fuel, and the men of food and warm clothing. Month 3 of the Invasion The Battle of Denali had taken nearly a full month, at the end of which Russian forces had finally broken past the rough terrain of the national park and adjoining areas. The cost was immense. Throwing their attack helicopter fleet sacrificially at the American defenders, they managed to savage U.S. strikers, but at the cost of nearly every Ka-52 in their inventory. There would be no more coming now that Japan had officially declared war on Russia and a joint Japanese-American naval task force had cut off the sea lane from Anchorage to Vladivostok. The terrain past Denali flattened out significantly, and the U.S. forces had beat a hasty retreat further north toward Fairbanks. However, the terrain quickly became difficult once again, and the Americans had blown up Hurricane Gulch Bridge. The gulch was not particularly impressive, barely 100 feet deep, but it was steep, and the bridge had been the only way across other than a railroad bridge, which too had been destroyed. There was not a single other road in this wilderness for the Russians to use, 
Highway 3 was the only link between Anchorage and Fairbanks. The Russians had naturally brought bridging equipment with them. American forces had naturally made the equipment a priority for their destruction in their ceaseless raids on the convoy. They could bridge the gulch, and they could push further north, where the terrain got even worse. Just past the small town of Cantwell, the highway went straight through a mountain range, and Russian soldiers shuddered at the thought of what nightmares the Americans had prepared for them there. They were bleeding out on a nearly three-month road trip through hell. The approaching spring would bring little relief other than slowing down the Americans, as they can no longer speed away in their snowmobiles through melting terrain. Spring breakup would make it worthwhile to start blowing bridges up again and bring a horde of mosquitoes, the unofficial Alaskan state bird, making soldiers miserable. It would also make more terrain accessible to ambush teams and make them more difficult to track as they'd no longer be leaving telltale tracks behind. The campaign was a lost proposition by any measure. At best, Russian forces could hope to secure Anchorage and the surrounding areas. Attempting to move east toward Canada would only put them in contact with Canadian armed forces, who had also heavily fortified the single route that the Russians could take to threaten them. But even in Anchorage, with the reshuffling of naval power in the Pacific and China's losses mounting, the Russians couldn't hope for meaningful resupply. What would happen is they would be trapped in the small pocket of Alaska that they'd managed to claim, completely overwhelmed by the sprawling wilderness of the wildest American state. The U.S. could then at its leisure bring its air power, freed from war with China, to bear on the Russian forces. The same narrow roads that the U.S. had used to defend were a death trap for a military without air superiority, attempting to pull off the same trick. Now go check out, what if the U.S. launched a nuclear bomb minute by minute before you get drafted into Putin's Alaskan army? Or click this other video instead.